Okay, after talking a little bit about the notation and formalism surrounding supervised learning, let us take a look again at the supervised learning pipeline and also discuss how we approach a machine learning problem in practice and what the individual components are that we usually worry about. So this figure is the figure that I showed you previously, the supervised learning workflow or overview. And that is a very simplified figure where we have a training data set that is a labeled uh, training set. So we have the labels for the features. And then we have a machine learning algorithm which learns yeah, the model learns to fit the model from the training data. So we get a model from here. And then once we have the model, we can provide the model with new data. And the model then makes the predictions. Of course, the assumption is always that the new data comes from the same distribution as the training data. Here is a flow chart that is a little bit more detailed. So the basic components are the same as on the previous slide. So I have my training set, I have a learning algorithm, and I get a model. And then we can use the model to make predictions on new data. However, um, here are a few more details. So in practice, before we get the training data, we also usually have to do some pre-processing. So unless you download the data from someone who already prepared the data set for you, you usually have to think about what features you extract from the data. This is especially important in traditional machine learning. So if you think back of the iris flower example, where we had iris flower measurements and we wanted to classify the iris flowers, it could be, for example, that we have an iris um, flower image data set, or we just observe the iris flowers in, in nature, in the real nature. And based on that, we have to extract some features that we want to provide the machine learning algorithm with. So we could give the machine learning algorithm the raw pixels from the image, but in conventional machine learning, it's usually better to yeah, use pre-processed features or extracted features. In the iris example, that was, for example, the um, sepal length and sepal width and so forth. Usually, uh, it really depends on the problem, but usually we also involve domain experts who know a little bit about the problem. So maybe a botanist who knows about iris flowers could help us picking some features that may be useful for classifying the flowers. Um, so assume now you have extracted these features. So from the raw data, let's say the images, you get the training set consisting of the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal um, width. Uh, there can be additional steps of pre-processing, for example, um, scaling the features or um, selecting features. For example, maybe you only want to select the petal dimensions, not the sepal dimensions. Dimensionality reduction, which is another broad topic that combines feature extraction and feature selection. We can also combine features. And um, yeah, subsampling the data set and so forth. There are many different pre-processing steps, and we will talk about uh, selection of them later in this course. And so, assuming we have done the pre-processing, we would then provide the learning algorithm with the data, fit the model. Um, but when we have the data set, we usually divide it into two parts. So we have a training set and a test data set. The training data set is used to fit the algorithm to obtain the model. And then we use the test data set as an independent data set to evaluate the performance of the model. So before we, before we use the model on real new data, we want to see how well it performs. So in this case, we pass, after we train it, we pass the data set to the model, to the final model. I'm writing final model here because in the learning steps, there um, are also evaluation steps. There's something called model selection, cross-validation, like um, different steps to evaluate the model during training to tune the hyperparameters. This is something that we will cover also in this course very extensively. We have about four lectures just devoted to model evaluation, selection, cross-validation, and so forth. Just um, for now, keep in mind that this already encompasses also some some evaluation procedure. So once we have the final model here, we use our test set 
and evaluate the performance. And that works uh, like this, that we use the model to predict labels. So these labels are the uh, labels predicted for the test set. And then we compare it to the true labels of the test set. So there's a comparison. And after we uh, evaluated our model, in a classification example, we uh, usually use the classification accuracy or classification error. So for example, we can maybe say we get 95% accuracy in terms of classifying the flaws correctly. And after we evaluated the model, we can then use it on new data. So then we have some new data and then also do some predictions in, in a real world application. So this slide is uh, maybe a little bit confusing at this point. There's a lot of information going on here, but we will cover these individual steps in way more detail later in this uh, course. So in practice, when we develop a machine learning application, there are usually many steps involved, and I try to condense it to five major steps here. So first of all, when we start working on a machine learning application or problem, we have to define the problem that we want to solve. Just uh, taking the previous example again of uh, the email classification, the, yeah, the task would be classifying or filtering spam email. Then we would have to collect a labeled data set. So for example, in this case, we would collect a body of emails, like 10,000, 50,000 emails, and also have the labels whether the emails are spam or not spam. Then we would choose an algorithm class. And with that, uh, this is not like, doesn't have to be a particular class of algorithms. So it could be multiple algorithm classes. Here I'm just saying is that certain types of algorithms are better for certain types of problems, certain types of data. But on the other hand, certain algorithms have certain properties. Sometimes we care about speed or we care about interpretability and we have different goals maybe for our machine learning application. In that way, we want to select certain algorithms that meet our criteria. So we not necessarily evaluate all possible machine learning algorithms. Um, then after we defined our algorithm class, let it be for now maybe decision trees. We will talk about different types of algorithms later. Then we will choose um, an optimization metric. And optimization metric, so I'm also writing measure because not um, every yeah, metric is a, or every measure is a proper metric. There are certain criteria for metrics, for example, uh, mathematically symmetry and the triangle inequality and so forth. But let's not uh, get distracted by these details. So we choose an optimization metric or an objective function that we want to optimize. And for example, in the case of decision trees, uh, common ones are the Gini impurity, information gain, um, entropy, and so forth. We will cover this in two or three lectures. And then after we defined what we want to optimize for training the model, we have to choose a metric that we use to evaluate the model. That could be something like um, prediction accuracy on the test set. So how many predictions that the model gets correct in the test set, for example, it could be one metric. And it's usually good to define all of this upfront um, so that we have an action plan where we develop our machine learning application. So regarding the objective function, the optimization uh, metric, we want to, uh, we use the objective function to optimize a optimization metric or measure. So there are different types of objective functions. I'm just uh, listing some of them here because you may have heard of them already. So we can, for example, maximize the posterior probability that is done in naive base classifiers. You can maximize the fitness function, which is usually done in genetic programming. You can maximize the total reward or value function, which is usually typical of reinforcement learning. Maximizing information gain, um, that is what we do in decision trees, in particular um, card decision trees. There are multiple types of decision trees, as we will learn about later. Or in uh, regression trees or linear regression, we minimize the mean squared error, maximize the log likelihood, in, um, or minimize the cross entropy in neural networks or logistic regression and minimizing the hinge loss. That's something we do in support vector machines. So you don't have to memorize that. I'm just showing you there are 
different objective functions that we optimize uh, depending on what type of machine learning algorithm or model we choose. So there are also different optimization methods for the different learning algorithms. So we have these objective functions that we optimize and also there are different ways we would optimize them. So there are combinatorial search, greedy search um, algorithms, which are, for example, in decision trees. Or for an unconstrained convex optimization, there are examples like linear regression or logistic regression. There's constrained convex uh, optimization that would be support vector machines, for example. Let me just write this down. Logistic regression. Um, Non-convex optimization. So for example, using backpropagation, which is based on the chain rule, that's the same, or in this case, um, the process of reverse auto differentiation, if you heard of it. Um, this would be in neural networks, which we won't cover in this course though. It's a topic for spring. And there's constraint con non-convex optimization, which is um, the non-convex optimization with a constraint. So for example, there's something called semi-adversarial networks, uh, one of my research areas um, that I developed with some colleagues. Uh, but also this is uh, beyond the scope of this class. Just um, trying to show you here there are many different ways you uh, can approach an optimization problem. Now, After talking about the optimization and the objective functions, now let's uh, briefly discuss the evaluation. So evaluating a, a model that has been fit to the training data. Um, so one common measure is the misclassification error that is computed as follows. So we use a so-called zero one loss, this one here. And we as assign for single data point a zero if the prediction matches or is the same as the actual class label for a data point in the test data set, for example. And we assign a one if the prediction does not match the actual label. And then we do this for all data points in the test set, for the n data points in the test set, and sum up these um, errors. So this part would be the total number of errors. And then we average over it, so we get a number between 0 and 1, a fraction. And usually we multiply this by 100%, so we get a number between 0 and 100% for the classification error. So similarly, we can also predict the classification accuracy by just, um, in this case, doing 1 minus the error. So 1 minus the error. And if we have the percent, we would of course have 100% minus the error in percent. So that would give us the classification accuracy. Both are commonly used, error and accuracy, because they are essentially the same thing. And usually this is the most common evaluation metric if we don't have any particular um, reason to use something else. Um, so now that I talked about the um, zero one loss, and then the classification error. I want to briefly say something about the term loss function. So here I use the term loss. Usually in traditional machine learning, loss refers to a single um, data point. So we compute the loss based on a single data point. And then when we look at the whole data set or a sample, if we have multiple data points like here, the end data points, we usually call this the, the cost. But this is a traditional uh, distinction between loss and cost. Nowadays, it's not so, um, yeah, people are not so picky anymore. So in literature, you often find the term loss to refer to the error as well. So whether we use loss or cost, it does not really matter. I try to make the distinction though for clarity to use the term loss when I refer to a single data point and the term cost when I refer to multiple data points. So, but yeah, like I said, uh, nowadays it's usually synonymous. So 
So next to the classification accuracy or error, there are many other evaluation metrics. For example, the receiver operating characteristic area under the curve, precision recall, sometimes there are also there's a flavor called F1 score that combines both of them, cross entropy, likelihood, squared error, L norms, utility functions, fitness functions, and so forth, um, or measures. And there are many yeah, different ways you can evaluate the model, and it really depends on the problem at hand. Usually by default, people use either the accuracy or the receiver operating characteristic area under the curve. But there may be reasons in certain applications to, you, to look at precision and recall, or the F1 score. In the certain applications, uh, it's also useful to look at the cross entropy. The cross entropy is also used um, as an objective function that we optimize, for example, in logistic regression or um, neural network training. But this is uh, getting way ahead of ourselves here. So we will cover this or these different types also in the model evaluation sections later on. Just um, showing you that these other methods exist. But usually most of the time in this course, we will focus on the classification error or accuracy. And uh, yeah, next. Let's, um, to finish up this lecture, let's talk about different machine learning approaches and motivations why we are interested in machine learning.